let me uh, let me go ahead and show you how this is going to work. There's all sorts of different methods of encryption. One of the methods that we can use is we can use a shared key. So, for example, I can go in and I can say that uh, here's my little file and it'll be unencrypted and I can use what's called a shared key. So I can say uh, A, B, C is my shared key. So then I use an algorithm that now, in fact let me go to green here, it now encrypts the file. So now we have this nice encrypted file. So then I transmit the encrypted file over to Susan and then over the phone I tell Susan, Susan, the passphrase is ABC. So she knows that it's ABC and then what can happen is, is it will decrypt the file and then Susan can read it. The only problem is, is that we have uh, evil Anthony. You can tell he's evil because his halo is broken. And what will happen with evil Anthony is if he hears that conversation that says, ooh, it's ABC, and he can get a copy of that encrypted document, he can also unencrypt it. So what we use to encrypt and what we use to decrypt are the same key. That's why they call it a, uh, a shared secret or a common encryption decryption. It's really fast, but it's not very secure. So another alternative is to go through and we will take our file and we will, we will use what's called a uh, asymmetric key. What's going to happen is, is I'm going to have two keys. So here's my one key. Where's my little, why isn't it drawing here? Here's my one key and we'll call this my private key. And here's my other key, which is my public key. And when I use asymmetric encryption, what happens is, is it uses a special mathematic formula that is one-way encryption. I will take um, a key and I will encrypt it, but I can't use that same key to decrypt it. Now this is where it gets a little weird. This is where it gets a little weird. Because what's going to happen is, is if I want to send it over to Susan again, and she's all smiley here, give her a little smiley face. That is a horrible smiley face. But I have to have her public key in order to encrypt. So she has two keys. She has her public key and she has her private key. And I have to take her public key to go through and encrypt the file. Then I transmit it to her. And then what Emily's going to do is she's going to take her private key and she will then be able to decrypt the file. Now think about this for a moment. I have to have a copy of, uh, I don't remember her name, Susan, of Susan's public key in order to encrypt a file for her. So if I wanted to encrypt a file to uh, Paul or to Scott or to Amir or to Bill or to Emily or to Susan or to Bart, or to Miguel, I have to have a copy of their public key. How do I get a copy of their public key? Well, it's, it's a public key. It's public. <laughs> so you can post this on the internet. I can give it to everybody that I want out there. But if everybody has a copy of it, what happens if we end up with the evil person again? And now we have the evil person, and he also has a copy of Susan's public key, this is one-way encryption. I cannot encrypt with the public key and then decrypt with the same public key. If he tries to decrypt this with the public key, number one, the cryptographic service provider, the little APIs and all the other stuff in the background are going to say, dude, this is a public key. You can't decrypt with the public key and it just won't work. If he finds some shareware utility that he's spent 40 bucks on the internet, it's still not going to work because in order to decrypt, the only way that you can decrypt is you have to have a copy of the private key associated with the public key. So if I send it to a mirror, I have to have a mirror's public key and for that to be decrypted, somebody has, a cop has to have a copy of a mirror's private key. 
So you give your public key to everybody. I've seen people that include it as their signature or as part of their uh, signature in their email. You give everybody the public key. The more people that have a copy of your public key, the more people can encrypt to you. But you do not share your private key with anyone. You, do, you don't do that. Now the gotcha with this is, is that one-way encryption is a really big algorithm. It's very, very complex. You have to carry the one in everything. It's really hard. So it takes a lot of processing power to do public-private uh, key encryption. And so what most systems use, including IPsec, in, including uh, secure socket layers, SSL, including transport layer security, including uh, EFS, the encrypting file system, is they use a hybridized method that combines speed of a shared key with the security of a public-private key pair. So you have symmetric and asymmetric. Let me, uh, let me show you how that works out. It's actually very clever. People that came up with this stuff are, they're geniuses. They're just geniuses. So here's my little document, and I'm going to send it to Susan. So here's Susan down here. And I have to have a copy of her public key. So this will be Susan's public key right here. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a bulk encryption. And bulk encryption uses a shared key. So I'm going to generate a key called ABC, and I will encrypt the document using the shared key. Ooh, kind of scary. So I have the document encrypted using the shared key. Now, this ABC, I don't pick. It is actually randomly picked by the computer, and it never uses the same value. Uh, over and over and over again. So it's not like I can predict what value you use. It goes in and does all sorts of really neat things to try and generate a random number. But then what it'll do is it will take her, her uh, public key and it will encrypt the shared key and add that as a header. So we have that encrypted inside of here. This entire package where you have the bulk encrypted document and the asymmetrically encrypted key is what I send over to Susan. And then I delete my remembrance of that shared key. So I don't have a copy of it anymore. Once Susan receives it and she double clicks it to open it because it's transparent, it will use her public key to extract the shared key of ABC then it uses the shared key to extract the document. And what's going to happen is, is she now has a copy of the document. So because we're using our bulk encryption key or our shared secret key, it is very, very fast. Then by encrypting the shared, key, uh, the shared secret, that is hard to break and it makes this little lockbox. Now this is called this little field right here is called the um, data decryption field. And that's what we use to, to pull this information out. Now here's the, the gotcha. What if I wanted to send this not only to Susan, but also to Bob and to Fred and to George and so on and so on. First thing that I have to do is I have to have a copy of all their public keys. So then what I do is I generate my little random number, 174, we'll just pretend. And I use that as the bulk encryption key to go through and encrypt the document. Then what I have to do is I have to use the public keys of everybody that I want to be able to decrypt it, and I create multiple data decryption fields. So we're going to have one for Susan using her public key. We're going to have one for Amir using his public key. We're going to have one for Scott using his public key. We're going to have one for Bart using his public key. We're going to have one for Ted using his public key. In order to decrypt, the owner of the private key, got a hair or something in my face, that's weird. The owner of the private key will unlock their particular data decryption field. 
and then they would find out the code is 174, and then they can go in and they can open up the document. So in order for me to create all these data decryption fields, man, what is this? <laughs> Big long hair. How fun is that? In order to gain access to this, your public key has to be available at the time of encryption. Because let's say that we hired evil George. So here's evil George. And now he's an administrator. And he really wants to get into this EFS document. Or maybe he stole somebody's laptop. He used the uh, ERD recovery utility to give himself administrative permissions. And now he's going to take ownership of this document. And he's going to try and decrypt it. The problem is that if you reset somebody's password, when you reset their password, their public-private key pair goes away. Unless they go in and do a normal recovery, where, or a normal password reset, where it retains your public-private keys. If I'm an administrator, I go into Active Directory User Computers, I right-click, say, Reset Password, that deletes the public-private key pair, and now that particular data recovery field is no longer valid because you don't have a private key to decrypt it. That's why uh, anytime you're going to reset somebody's password, you need to make sure that they have a password recovery disk. Otherwise, if you manually go in there and reset it, any encrypted files that they have, they can't read it anymore. If somebody else's data decryption, or if somebody else was added to it at the time of encryption, they can read it because they would go into their particular data decryption field and pull the information out. But here we have Evil George. So Evil George is now an administrator. And uh, he wants to be able to go in and access his file so he takes ownership of it. But George's public-private key pair is not included in the data decryption field, so he can't read it. He can't. So why do they say that this is really used mostly for stolen laptops? Because I have to have everybody's private key, or their public key, in order to do the initial encryption. And if I want to give it to uh, Julia, who just got hired in the company, I'm going to have to decrypt it and then re-encrypt it, and I have to make sure that I add her uh, file or her uh, public key so that we can add her to the data decryption field. Otherwise, she can't access it. So um, here's another thing. They have what is called a encrypted file recovery agent, uh, a recovery agent. What the recovery agent does is it's designated. Now, uh, by default, in Windows uh, server machines, the administrator account in the domain is automatically a recovery agent. You can also go in and you can delegate other recovery agents. But what happens there is, is anytime anybody encrypts an EFS file that's a member of the domain and they have been told through a group policy or whatever that we have a recovery agent, it's going to go ahead and add their public key to the data decryption field. But that administrator's public key is also going to be used to create another entry. It's exactly the same, but they call it the data recovery field. So it's exactly the same. It works the same. It smells the same. It does the exact same thing with a public and private key pair. They just call it a different name. <laughs> that's, that's the only difference. This recovery agent has to be identified prior to this file being encrypted. Otherwise, they're not going to be in a data decryption field. And if I have multiple recovery agents that I have designated before the file was encrypted, it just adds additional data recovery fields. So that's what it does. And when Evil George came in, his public-private key set wasn't involved in this, so if he tries to tack it on, he can't because he doesn't know what the key is because that key is contained inside these recovery fields or the data decryption field. So it makes it very, very difficult for somebody to come in and uh, peel it off.